this episode is brought to you by Tanmay Shah. That's me. Best way to support this show is by sharing this with your friends and dropping a comment and review on YouTube, Apple Podcasts and Spotify. You can become my patron and a sponsor. That's not all. You can buy Rockla's merchandise and NFTs and much more. See all the links in description for details. Rockla's Radio. Rockla's. 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 Rockla's Radio with Tom Myshaw. Say Belgium waffles. Yeah, Belgium waffles or something like that. Yeah, indeed. It's a typical. I'm, I'm in Liège. I'm in the, the hometown of, uh, of the waffles right now. <laughs> oh, is it? Yeah, yeah. This is uh, if you come to Belgium, uh, people will say we have the best waffles. But actually, the Liège waffle—that's the, the, the first waffle ever of Belgium. So that's uh, your waffle hometown, not Brussels, Liège. Oh, hmm. very interesting. We're going to talk yeah, about I, waffles. I'm, I'm not sure where, where are you based uh, somewhere. I'm in India. Okay. Yeah. So have you, if you ever come to Belgium. If you ever go waffle hunting, Liège is your, uh, your place to be. Yeah. And <coughs> Liège is spelled L-I-G-E-T. L-E-I-G-E. Okay. Liège. Liège. Uh, it's a, it's a, French, a French word. Yeah. French pronunciations are a bit difficult to grasp, you know, because it is written something else and it's pronounced as very something very Impos- different. Impossible. Impossible. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Rock Class Radio. On today's episode, we have with us Bart von der Roost, who is a Secretary General of Royal Philan- Philharmonic Orchestra. He is an experienced cultural manager and artistic producer. He is the founder of Neo. Scores, an online marketplace for digital sheet music. He is deeply in love with classical music and opera and will forever be an aspiring musician. He has a strong interest in green technology, uh, sustainable business, and he loves, loves it to love it when art touches the real world, real life, and vice versa. You should check out his TED talk on the artist is dead. Long live the creative entrepreneur. Welcome to the show, Bart. Thank you, Tanmay. Thank you so much for inviting me. Bonjour. Bonjour. Is that what you say in the French part of yeah. <laughs> Belgium? It's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm actually, uh, Belgium is a really small country in the center of Europe, uh, but we speak uh, two languages here. We have, uh, but I'm from the, the Flemish part, so we speak a sort of Dutch, but in French you say bonjour. In, in Flemish you say guten dag. Couldn't talk. That is so yeah. German. Yeah, it's it's very similar. Yeah. <laughs> and what do you mean by Flemish? What what? How does that does that word represent something? Yeah, it's it's uh, yeah. So Belgium is set up in two parts. We have the the Flemish region where we speak Flemish. It's the the northern part of the country, which is next to uh, the Netherlands and and so uh, adjacent to to Germany. And so right. Flemish is, uh, it's not a dialect, it's, it's language which resembles German, which resembles Dutch. It's uh, we, we kind of more or less understand one another. And then uh, <clears throat> and the south part of the country is the French speaking part. And then Brussels or capital, that is where we speak uh, the two languages. And if you, if you ask how to be a good Belgian, at least you speak the two languages. So the Flemish and, uh, and uh, the uh-huh. French. So this is where is uh, Belgium. It is right between um, France, Germany, and England. Yeah, <laughs> it's a really small, a really beautiful country. But it's uh, ten million, ten million people. So uh, I think more or less the size of uh, New York or uh, I think um, Mumbai or so. Uh, it's like a... <laughs> <laughs> yes, half the size of Mumbai. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, so it's, you are joining us from where is yes, in, the, in the south part, uh, next next to the German border. Okay. Yes, you are right here. 
Okay, so this part is Flemish. Is this part Flemish? Yeah, so the upper part is Flemish and the uh, down the, the down part is uh, is uh, French speaking. Okay, so there's a border here. So you have divided it, the like... It's a sort of it's not a real border, it's what we call the language border and it's also ah. if, you, if you if you look at uh, Europe, it's more or less a division uh, in history between the the Protestant uh, northern part and the Catholic southern part. So it's it's uh and also, it's it's a it's a border that has been there for like two two thousand years. It's not a real border because, yeah, people cross it all all the time. But um, it, it, so it even a, in it's a cultural difference as well a little bit. Mm -hmm. Even in Belgium, the north is not the northern Belgium is uh, Protestant and the southern Belgium is Catholic. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it's it's uh, it used to be like that. I think it's not not the case anymore. But that's that's the typical historical uh, explanation that you get. Um, mm -hmm. Also, the, the Flanders. We, we uh, I'm from Flanders. We typically tend to look up, like to Netherlands, to Denmark, to Norway. And if you're in the southern part of the country, you typically look down to France, to to Spain, to Italy, as to your cultural references and uh, and ah. as to. Uh, uh, it's it's a it's a, our our most famous artist is uh, René Magritte. He's like a surreal artist, and I think that's what Belgium is. It's a, a country that you can only explain by saying what it is not. Um, mm. I'm, I'm not I'm not saying that I'm that I'm not proud to be Belgian. I'm saying that uh, as a country we are so in between these major other countries that I I like to say that Belgian people they are they yeah by definition we're open. By definition, our market is is Europe, and by definition, you can only say um, you can only explain Belgium by saying what it's not. It's not like like uh, like it's not a real country. Uh, that's something which we often say in Belgium. <laughs> it's not a real country. Yeah. And even your stance in the world was was neutral, right? So because everybody, all kind of people are there. Yeah, in, in, uh, yeah, I think I think so. Yeah, indeed. Uh, and also, with, with, it's typical if you're in between. Uh, and of course, that's now history. Uh, and I'm uh, happy to be in the center of, of Europe. But it's uh, of course, if you're in between those huge powers, France, Germany, and UK, uh, we are the, the typical battleground of uh, of a lot of historic uh, historic uh, fights. Yeah, the trenches and all that. It reminds me uh, of those movies. Uh, so this is Brussels, the capital, and Antwerp, another famous city for diamonds, I believe. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm and... from Antwerp. That's my home. Oh, yeah. This is your home. Yeah. All right. So th is this the Waterloo of the Battle of England and France? Yeah, that's is exactly this... that Waterloo. You, you see, we are the historic battleground of those major uh, states. <laughs> oh my God! Wow. Yeah, there's a good. Uh, plain land to yeah. fight a war. <laughs> All right. So very interesting to have you today. And the first question I want to ask you is please guide us through your journey of being a creative entrepreneur or an artpreneur as we call it. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a typical thing. Um, um, I, I always say in my heart, I am a musician. So I'm somebody who likes to be on the stage, to create, to play music. In my case, it's classical music, but um, like like performing, uh, being on the stage, and it's it's I, it's not like per se selling. It's like telling stories and and being there and helping create some magic on stage uh, when it's when it's time. But for me, it's always been double. I always have this other side as well, where I like to put things into strategies, into models, to see, uh, for it, I work for a, a symphonic orchestra right now, to see uh, what our DNA is, uh, making beautiful music, but how to translate that into an Excel, how to make sure that a government wants to give subsidies. So it's my left side and my right side of my brain that always work together. And therefore, I'm, I'm not saying that I'm an artist, because that's that's something I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm working at a desk, I'm doing administrative task but i do um, i do deal in business i i am on the on the hard side of 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 this uh, of this industry and so um my first diploma i ever gotten was that of a musician i i am a master in music but my second diploma is a master in business administration and that i think sums up really neatly what i do 
And I tend to say that in my career, every four, five, six years, I go from being in large organizations, helping them to thrive and to innovate to smaller, like uh, entrepreneurial stuff and really trying to invent uh, new ways of, of uh, forming this. And as you explained in, in your introduction, that Neo's course is typically on the entrepreneurial side of things, like from nothing coming to a company. And on the other side, where I'm working now is more in a structure, uh, a bigger, uh, a bigger, uh, a bigger uh, business, and and uh, helping them to 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 process better and to become even more uh, more uh, more successful. So what? <clears throat> that's very interesting to know. You are the current secretary general of Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. So first of all, what, is, what does a philharmonic orchestra mean and uh, what are your roles and responsibilities there? So yeah, philharmonic, if you uh, trace it back to the roots, phil comes from the ancient Greek, which means beautiful or good. And harmonic means sounding together. So uh, it's literally a good sounding uh, organization. What a philharmonic does, it's uh, typically associated to a city, like Liège is in this case. And we are the main orchestra of, uh, of the city and of our region. And what we do is during a, during a year, we have what we call our season. We perform concerts, classical concerts, but we also do uh, film music. We do recordings. We uh, play in schools. And I always say uh, the ideal philharmonic orchestra is like a museum, but it's living. On the one hand, we help uh, culture, heritage, our history to survive. So in any given season, in any given year, you can come to us and like you go in the museum looking at a beautiful statue or like a beautiful painting, you can come to us and listen to a beautiful Beethoven, to a beautiful Mahler, to a beautiful Mozart. That's our museum function, but it's living because we always have to redo it. If you don't play the music of Mozart, it's not there. Uh, so you have to do it again and again and again in order to, to, uh, to experience it. And I call it also living because, yeah, it's uh, like all good art should do. It should always reflect the time that you're in. Uh, for instance, I give you one good example. Um, during our history, we kind of forgotten about female composers, to name but one thing. And I think it's our role then to look back at history, not to forget how beautiful Beethoven is and how valid its, its message is still for the people of today, but also take a look who have we forgotten. And secondly, uh, Always, I think it's, it's, it's imperative for any good cultural organization, who are the makers of today? Who are the relevant voices of today? Who are the Beethovens, the Brahms, and the Mozarts of today? And that's, I think, our double role. And that's, as an orchestra, I think we do really well. We give commissions to new, um, to new composers. We look over the edges of what we can do. For instance, this season, we are going to work together with a DJ to see uh, if you give a qualified DJ uh, not everybody, but a good DJ, if you give them access to what we have to offer, what do we do? And that's something uh, why uh, the, the death of classical music has been announced already, I don't know what, 500 times, but it's still really, really vibrant and we even uh, are going up in subscriptions here if you make it relevant for today. And people still see us as, on the, on the one hand, a fantastic night out of high quality uh, looking at history, but also with an outlook on today uh, and how can you uh, have this machinery that is an orchestra at, at, at our biggest, we are over 120 people on, on, on stage. Uh, what does that still say? And in all my experience in going to rock concerts, in going to, 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 to dance evenings and whatsoever, there is nothing that comes across the power of being in a hall at a certain moment with like 1,000, 1,500 people in the hall and those 100 and 120 people on stage performing non-amplified for you, that's still one of the strongest feelings that I, that I have. And um, it doesn't have to be classical, but the fact that it's non-amplified, that there is this human or this, 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 this uh, set of humans trying to, to convey something to you without words, without, without, without colors, without, without showing it, just by audio, that's still magical. And then for me, it doesn't matter if it's, if, if it's like Renaissance music or if it's music of today. It's that magic that, that we look for. And that's what I do here. 
uh, in my current role as Secretary General, what I actually do here is I do three things. I do, yeah, on the one hand, it's not boring, it's really interesting, but it's like the administration type of things, make sure that we pay our taxes on time and so on and so on and so on. So it's the, the machinery of, of, of what do you need to do behind to make sure that we perform our art. The second thing that I do is uh, on the long haul, uh, we are thinking about a strategy uh, and that also connects to, to this heritage thing. We are located in a beautiful 19th century hall, but more and more you see that a 19th century solution as to accommodate audiences and so on and so on is not per se the ideal one for the 21st century because people have changed in, in their behavior. Uh, I'll give you one good example. Our, our income hall downstairs is optimized for chariots with horses and so on. But yeah, today people come wow. by bikes and, 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 and so that's a really a thing we should, we should take a look at. And uh, the second thing with, with that hall, a 19th century hall has awful energy efficiency. So how to make sure that we keep this, this, uh, this uh, old school heritage alive, but adding this 21st century, uh, 21st century needs in durability, in energy and sustainability and so on. And the third thing that I need to do is uh, uh, we become more and more international and uh, how to make sure that we keep on track uh, with this internationalization of the industry. Give you another example. 30 years ago, everybody here in the orchestra spoke French and was from the neighborhood. Right now, we have over 13 nationalities in the orchestra and we speak uh, English, French, German, Dutch, uh, Chinese, uh, Polish, whatever. So how to make sure that uh, we stay on top of things and we uh, remain a fantastic international uh, and high quality ambassador of, of classical music. And by doing so, making sure that we as a, a work giver are a good place to work at. That's our, my, more or less my three, uh, my three functions here. Uh, and close collaboration with the CEO, of course, and with uh, my colleagues. Wow. And as you are speaking, let me now pull up photos from the live museum, as you call it, which is an amazing term for orchestras. Beautiful. So this is what, which hall is this? Yeah, this is our main hall. This is uh, this is um, the place where we are at. We are very happy to uh, to be also the uh, we uh, the 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 main user of this hall. So it's it's the hall where we uh, and perform and also rehearse. That's a luxury that not a lot of orchestras have. And moreover, this hall it sounds fantastic. It's one of the best acoustics that I know. Um, and the orchestra in it, uh, yeah, it sounds really really well. It's so beautiful. It's so ancient. Like there are so many galleries here, people here. Like but, I've seen a Beethoven movie. It is taking me back to that. <laughs> but but you see, that's also the the. It's a downside of this. This hall is typical for the for the nineteenth uh, century uh, society. So we have like two to three hundred very good places downstairs. That was for the rich people back then, and then you have all this this upstairs, which actually. Your visibility on stage is not that good. It sounds good, but it's difficult to reach. If you're um, if you're uh, a people in a, a people in a wheelchair or people with disabilities, we actually we can't. We have one or two places that we can make ready for you, but that's not uh, in the nineteenth century. Those people will, will simply not come to the to the concerts. If we want to have them uh, right now at our concerts, it's really becoming a problem, and that's one of the things I need to solve: how to make sure that we keep all the good things of this history, of this fantastic hall with all of the, the gold and all of the, uh, all, all of the, the how to say, the, the atmosphere that comes, comes with it, but how to make sure that even in the 21st century, you keep on attacking people. Another, another problem that we have, for instance, that I need to solve is we have no air conditioning. So right now we're, we're in summer here, it's 32 degrees outside. So the hall is really warm. And that's something which you can't, you simply can't uh, afford in uh, in today's world uh, to to accommodate your audience in such a in such a bad uh, 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 thermal environment. And the same applies to the bar. Uh, our bar can uh, easily serve two hundred people, the rich people of back then. But if we have a full hall of eleven hundred, it's really becoming a problem to serve them all in a in a in a nice way. Uh, their drinks. And that's that's the that's the the problem we need to fix. How to keep what's good from the past, 
but how to add something from the future to it that we can keep on doing what we're doing. Wow, it's so beautiful. And there are so many aspects to it. Uh, glad through your medium we're getting to know. I got an, another image of like perspective of the orchestra of the crowd to the crowd. So this image here. Yeah. Yeah, okay, it's not that clear. Yeah, yeah. no, it's it's a, uh, and it's also it's a it's a hall where everybody is really close. So uh, even if it's a full hall of eleven hundred, you have the sense that the orchestra is playing only for you. It's really an intimate, uh, it, it, intimate setting. Oh, this image! Wow, beautiful. Yeah, magnificent. Even this one. So is this another hall or is the same one? This is. Yeah, this is still a hall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, it's it's so. And I I really like how you said that without amplification. Yeah, I mean, for generation now, it's like they don't know, they won't understand what does that mean or how. Yeah. But it's like horsepower, right? The more horse you have, the more power you have. So they're like more violinist or more instruments to create more noise. <laughs> you know, you know. In in a way, I've I, of course I have nothing against amplification, but whenever something is amplified, uh, there is always this. The sound electric can, can can do a, can mask a lot. For instance, if you uh, like echo or reverb on a voice, yeah. If you're a bad singer, in this hall, we will hear that you're a bad singer. Whilst if you're a bad singer with a good sound engineer. Uh, and and again, nothing against a good sound engineer. And of course, in some cases, you should amplify. If if we play with the orchestra outside uh, on on, a, on the stage, you have to be amplified, of course. But this hall, and I think that's the beauty of what we do is uh, we do it all natural. This is what you see is what you get and what you hear, and that's what I like about uh, about about uh, about good musicians. They said if you put a jazz trio in here of a good funk band or whatever in the hall. Um, it will always also also sound good, and that's something what what we actually do uh, more and more and more. We also perform um, like uh, what they call world music or jazz or ancient music in the in this hall. It's not only symphonical music that we uh, that we do. Wow, it's it's beautiful. Uh, my next question is: You talked about DJ and all these people, and we all have been hearing them. But when it comes to orchestra and that kind of music, we just remember the guy singing his wand, Harry Potter's <laughs> wand, and then other musicians in harmony, they are playing and there is a lot of action sort of happening. So for somebody who is new to experiencing this orchestra music, uh, what steps would you tell them to appreciate it or what things, what nuances would you ask them to observe? I, th I think it's the same as, as going to a DJ or whatever. Just go. Uh, I think what the beauty of music is, and this is something which I call the shiny eyes moment. And it's, it's the moment that your eyes light up, either from emotion, like you start crying because yeah, you feel something, either because you understand. And what I like about music, and this applies for all types of music, uh, you don't have to know anything about it to like it. If you come to a symphony uh, or a concert, for instance, what we say now is just come as you please. You don't need to dress up. I, let me start, I, I'll, I'll start with something else. For me, personal, the best way to go to a symphony orchestra is like this. I like to go to a restaurant before. I like to dress up in my costume and I like to come in at 8 o'clock in the evening and have like a an overture, a concerto, a break, and then your symphony. That's for me the perfect night out. For other people, it's other other, other stuff, uh, like just coming in for one piece. I think come as you are. You don't need to understand anything. The only thing that I can that I can recommend is the more you know, the better the experience becomes. But it's similar if you go to if you go to a Red Hot Chili Peppers concert and you don't know any of the songs, I think you can be impressed by, wow, everybody knows it. They're performing really well. But if you know the songs, the concert will get better. If you know the story behind the singer, the concert becomes better. If you are placed at the perfect spot from the PA system, your concert... so the more you know and understand, the, the better it gets. I give the example of, of uh, Beethoven. Beethoven has written for me uh, music that transcends. Beethoven is always about big ideas, about freedom, about, about love, about, about, 
anxiety. So the teams that Beethoven touch, touches are, are, are without age or without, without borders. If you then know that in the way uh, Beethoven uses instruments, compared to what has been done in history 50 years before and 50 years after, then you get an extra layer. You can really say, wow, this was really somebody who was an innovator in his time. If you then understand how harmony works, how, how, how notes are put one on top of one another, you get yet another dimension. If you then play an instrument yourself, like violin or so, and you can understand how difficult it is to play a certain uh, piece of music uh, in Beethoven, you get another layer. And so that's, that, that's what they, my, for me, I think the beauty about classical music or music in general, the more you know, the better it gets. But in order to feel it, you don't need to know anything about it. That's, that's I think, uh, uh, how I, I should do it. The only thing that I can say about classical music is typically you don't start with the extremes. You don't start with like really early music of really music of today. That's for me something you can do in the second step. I think the best way in is just to, to, to look for a good symphony orchestra uh, in your neighborhood uh, and, and just go in and try to experience it. Uh, there, is a, there has been a study, uh, I think it was Deloitte that did it uh, a couple of years ago, about the importance of music education or the music of the, the importance of cultural education in a way. And what they said is, if before you're 18 years old, you get in touch with a certain form of art, like painting or whatever of music, seven times, that's the maximum you need to be bitten by it. And for the rest of your life, you, you, keep, you, you keep it across. That's what you, what, what you need to get us to this shiny eyes moment that, that we talked about earlier. That's what I should say to somebody. If you come, come one, two, three, four, five times. If by then you don't like it, don't do it. Go to other concerts. Uh, but uh, I'm so convinced by the power of classical music because it's, it's the best that we have for 400 years. And what we still perform today is the best of the best of the best. Uh, I always say, uh, with, uh, I, I, I laugh a little bit about it. Um, what is the Mozart of today? I don't know. The people of 80 years from now will be able to say the Mozart of 2023 that was a certain DJ or a certain composer. I think we can, from a Western European point of view, we can now start to be saying the Mozarts of the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, those were the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. Because after so many years, we still enjoy their music and we're still performing them. So if time passes by and you keep on being on top of, of, of playlists, then I think you, you're, you have done something, something good. Um, but it's to be seen and it remains personal. What I like is not per se what you like. And also culture is really important. If you're, uh, if you're born in, in, uh, in Central Africa uh, or you're born in, uh, in Australia or whatever, uh, per, most probably your point of view on what is good and what is bad or, or what you like and what you don't like will be different. Uh, but and this is the last thing I would like to say about it. The best... Uh, Indian music or the best uh, Peruvian music, I can recommend. Yeah, that's good music. And if you let me, if you let me hear, uh, like like uh, uh, a beginning, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, Chinese singer or a, a very established Chinese singer, both of us will say perhaps I don't like them both, but you can say yeah, the quality of that one is better. And for me, that's the same with symphony music. Good symphony music transcends culture, transcends time, and transcends. Uh, even personal appreciation. You just hear that it's good or you, you, you feel that it's good music. Wow. Beautiful. Uh, one quick uh, sound enhancement uh, on the right, on your right side. Mm -hmm. Can you roll it on your ear? Because the mic is hitting your collar and it makes clicking sounds. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Wait, I'll, yeah. Um, <laughs> or I'll just, I'll just hold it like this. That's perhaps better. No, no, you maybe wrap it around so that yeah. your hands will be free. Yeah. Let me see if I can do it. Better? Awesome. Okay. Okay. So you talked about different mu uh, musics and particularly about classic musics. I want to give a shout out to Mr. Ratan Bhatliwala. Who is my who is my teacher from college with whom I got to hear a lot of orchestra music like he loves them he used to sit and watch and uh, tell me about it um, 
I have one question for you. Most of these are in Italian or some uh, other Latin language. How, where can we find English ones? Because, or language doesn't matter in orchestra. What do you think? It, it, it matters and it doesn't matter. Um, I'll give you one, one uh, anecdote of Mozart uh, that says to, uh, to whoever was writing the text, don't make it super good. Just make it good enough that people understand the story. Because if the text is too good, I have difficulty putting the music under. So Mozart said always, I'd like my text to be average. In, in, in the end, there, there is some fantastic uh, English repertoire eh? in, in opera and in, 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 uh, in songs. And so I, I'm thinking of Benjamin Britten to name but one. Um, but of course, yeah, uh, music, and especially if you're in classical music the, in, the, in the history, music tends to be in the, the language that was predominant at, the, at that time. So we have a lot of French opera, we have a lot of French, French songs, we have Italian songs, we have German songs. It depends a little bit on, on, uh, on, the, on the time period. Um, but it's irrelevant. Uh, the most beautiful song that I know uh, is the song to the moon from Rosalka from Dvorak, and it's it's written in uh, in uh, uh, Dvorak was from I don't know, I think it's not Polish, Germany, Austria. Yeah, yeah uh, it's 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 in a language that I don't understand, but it's a song from a girl that is in love to the moon. Yeah, and you just feel, you feel this, and you you understand even if you don't you don't speak the language. I speak German. Not fantastic. I don't understand everything, but you do understand if if uh, uh, Richard Strauss he has this what is called the four last songs, which are in German, and you immediately understand. Yeah, this is something that has to do with a, a love that has been gone, or something that is as as as. Uh, uh, it's it's the same as I, I, I told earlier. So if you don't know anything about it, and I let you listen to the four last songs of Strauss, you will probably say, "Wow, this is really beautiful music." But if I then tell you that it's literally the four last songs that Strauss has been written. So he was 83 years old. And one month before he died, he wrote his four last songs. If you know that, and if you then listen to the songs, and you listen to how they are, uh, in which order they are, then you see this is sort of a testament. And if you then listen to the last song of the last songs, it's called Im Abendrot, which is called in the, eve, the red evening, in the, in, the, in the last moments of the day. You understand that it is... Strauss is saying goodbye to people. And the last, the last uh, words that the soprano sings is, am I dead now? Question mark. And so all of a sudden, this gets a, a, a sort of a, a, a personal touch to it from the composer. But what you also see in, in, in the harmonization of this song is that after the soprano has stopped singing, he continues for two to three minutes looking for an end. So the music is looking and strauss has experimented with with harmony with rhythm with 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 uh, atonality and so, so he's really looked for for all of these different ways of 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 looking for ex, uh, emotion and experiment and what he does in the end he goes to the most simple form of ending a song like do a subdominant to a dominant and then to a tonica and ends a song in 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 total tranquility that's for me what what the music can do. If you don't know anything, you will say, yeah, yeah, nice music. But if you know the story behind, it evolves, and it's in German. I don't speak German per se, but I immediately feel that it's that it's that it's something meaningful and something which which surpasses uh, the day. Um, and I think if you translate the song into English, just to just to, I think you will you will you will lose a lot. I think it's it's best that it stays uh, in in the in the original. Uh, but yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, I'll keep those points uh, when I watch the orchestra next. Maybe just today I'm going to watch. So, which uh, are your videos available on YouTube? From the orchestra, you mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah there are a lot of videos available. We have a YouTube channel, and we are also on. Uh, it's called Medici TV. It's like a, a specialized classical music channel uh, that almost all of our concerts are are, uh, are there. Okay, I'll take your link from you and then I'll post it in the description. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we invest heavily in this because that's also something about classical music because it's so limited to a specific hall on a specific time. I think our digital uh, approach should be that being all over the world through uh, digital channels. Uh, and it's the same with durability. That's also something we should we, I, I can touch upon. This is really a discussion that we have right now. Uh, do we, as an orchestra from Belgium, need to be present in the whole world, intercontinental. 
because it's a lot of CO2. Whilst the, the next best thing uh, being online, that's something we can easily do without all of this cost. And secondly, I do think it's good that every region or every every position in the world has a has a fantastic orchestra. Uh, that's 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 a question that we I, I don't know, I don't have the answer to, but that's something we are discussing internally right now. What is our position in this? What is what is our role in society, and what is our role to the world? And how do we promote music without without breaking uh, without breaking the planet? Very interesting. For the whole orchestra to travel, as you said, will be a lot of uh, things to carry and a lot of CO two. And also, I think taking the whole orchestra out of their main environment that loses its charm because that whole uh, orchestra and the setting arrangement you have that comes with a package, right? You you got to travel to Belgium and be there to. It's, I experienced that. It's, it's double. I, I don't know if you followed the whole uh, Coldplay are now touring in a CO2 neutral way. I think that's really interesting because they, they are accounting for whatever they, their, their, uh, whatever they uh, put into bad things they try to neutralize. But that's typical for Coldplay. Coldplay only play the Coldplay song. So a Coldplay cover band, that's not the same. In classical music, that's different. We play composers and therefore we make interpretation at, at, at each and every place. This, this set, it's really good for an orchestra to travel, to come into another hall, into another culture, into another city, into another environment, because you always learn from these connections. You always learn from being somewhere where you're not used to it. I, I think being an artist is always in, the, in a way of being very good at what you do, but also questioning what you're doing. And one of the ways you can question yourself is by moving away the things that you know, your, your hall that you know so well, your, your position, your, the type of music that you're playing. So it's, 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 um, it's an exercise in uh, making sure that your quality stays on top, but also making sure that you're not falling asleep, that you, that you uh, get new impressions. Uh, and especially the, 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 the best artists that I know are people that are always open and always looking out for something new to uh, to achieve, and touring is a is a very good way to do so with an orchestra. So I'm not not against touring, but what I'm saying is, um, 20 years ago it, we didn't care; we just took the plane whenever we needed to. And now we think, yeah, what's what's out? If we want to tour, why are we touring? What are we what are we what are our ideas? Uh, what we want what we want to obtain? And if we have some damage, how to make sure that we repair the damage that we that we that we uh, that we make? <laughs> On orchestras, there are a lot of these TikTok and Instagram videos where they bring in different kind of artists. Like there was one lady who was splashing water and making sound with water and uh, in, immersing instruments in that. And there was one person just with a ukulele. Or there was one person who was just whistling. Like they call him to the front and these solo performance, they act that. Those are very interesting Absolutely, to see. Yeah. Well, whenever, if, it's, if it's good, it's good. And you always hear it. Um... I will not say that there will be an explosion of water concertos. I think it's it's a one time one one time thing, but it's interesting, and it's also it's it's again the living museum. On the one hand, uh, we need to experiment and we need to see what are the new sounds of today. On the other hand, yeah, uh, it's still amazing to listen to a Brahms violin concerto, which has been untouched for like 100, 700 years, and every time again and again we get this new talent coming in and taking a look at it. It's also something which which I am so surprised by. There are some pieces of work that have been recorded like I don't know, five hundred times, and still somebody says no. I want to make the five hundred and one recording of this specific piece. That's something which I so like that that we always give this 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 new chance. This is a, an ongoing circle of life thing that we do, and we reinterpret, we rediscover, and every time we get like let's say children in the hall. It's amazing to see that sometimes music of 400 years old, when we put it in front of children of five, six, seven years, they say like, oh, wow, I like this. And that's something which, uh, that's why I'm very optimistic about the future of classical music because it's, it's so powerful. Wow. And so, it's so easy to, to, if we get people in the hall, we, we win. <laughs> we have them in our hearts. And what I am personally looking forward is a fusion of suppose Indian classical and Western classical. Mm -hmm. That'll be so cool to watch. I would like I would especially come to Belgium or if you could come here, especially come for that show because they are so different. 
according to my limited knowledge of this my mother is a musician uh, and what i've read is in indian classical music the focus is on the singer the main singer mm-hmm. and the different uh, levels of pitches and tones and rhythms he sings and the people around them are sort of supporting but in western it is huge uh, so many people like in indian there are like four five people on the stage but in the western orchestra it's like hundreds of people and them playing in harmony that is considered to be that is something to be appreciated so both these aspect coming together i'm performing a fusion that would be so awesome to think what are your thoughts it i think fusion is uh something i like the especially when you fuse cultures there is always a downside to it because yeah how to fusion without losing yourself i think it's what is obvious for me is always you should uh uh, treat everybody with respect. Uh, for instance, in, in, uh, in you, you can't expect from an Indian musician to be automatically also good in Western music and vice versa. So if you want to do this, I think you should be uh, you should give them the time to get to know one another. Uh, what I what I and it's also in fusion. I think ideally you have some friction. You have some some things that don't work or or that because the most interesting stuff comes from where it doesn't work and that you analyze why it doesn't work. Uh, I gave the example earlier of a DJ, and I think that's also a good example. That's not a, a mixture of cultures, that's a mixture of genres. And what I don't like is if the DJ sees the orchestra as a jukebox, just uh, do what I like or, or, or adapt to what I need. It should always be about communication and about interaction. And then I think it's good. And even if it, the end result is then bad, I don't think it's bad per se because the, the process was good. But if you say, uh, uh, for in our case, if we just say, okay, uh, for our audience, we put in some Indian musicians and we'll let, just let them play Indian music and we don't explain why we want to do this, I'm not a fan because then you're not fusioning. You just, you're just putting something on stage without any introduction or without any explanation why you're doing it. Uh, therefore, fusion projects are are time-wise costly and also in, in money costly because you need a, a lot, lot of time. i give you an example. If we do a classical Western concert, we need a week. We start on Monday with rehearsing and on Friday we do the concert. If we do a fusion concert, it takes several months because yeah, you get to know one another and you know what, what the things are. Alone on the music theory level, uh, as far as I understand from Indian music, we use a, a 12-tone system. So we have like seven nodes which we divide in halves, and therefore you get to a, a, an octave which has uh, 12, 12 separate tones. In the Indian system, it can go up as much as 48 or, or 24. So your approach on what is a right note or a wrong note is already different. In the rhythms as well, yeah, you have this... this uh, we as, as rhythms, we tend to look at it in measures. We, we say, okay, a measure has four beats, one, two, three, four, and then we subdivide the beats in uh, non-Western music, you often work with ranges or you often work with like uh, uh, mantras or, or, or like uh, very difficult things that invert and so on and so on. There's this one guy on Instagram that I love. I don't understand a bit about what he's doing. It's called Music Shiraz or something like that. And he explains like the non-Western music to Westerns. And I'm every time I'm surprised, wow, how complex is this? And if you then look at how he See, Western music, you say, yeah, Western music is so complex to me, but for me, it's like, I know it's really easy. So your, your point of view, the place where you were born, the place where you were educated is so important uh, that, that what is difficult for you is easy for me and vice versa. Um, coming to this, uh, uh, fusion, I, I do think it's important that, that, that we do it. If you have respect from you, for your starting position, if you take the time to get to know one another, and if you really make sure that it's a fusion, like uh, not saying, okay, now you're just, now you're funk, really trying to, to put those two together and try to create some friction and try to create a resolution as well. And then, I, then, I, then I, I'm a huge fan of it. Yeah. That would be amazing. I think we have got a lot of technology and AI to the for the composer. So if you have a composer who is educated in both Indian and Western and somehow he could create a common theme and then also like like in jazz they just keep improvising and playing right so finding those key 
key issues that can tie one common string that ties the whole performance together and then people can do as they want and improvise that what Absolutely. do you think about that it's it's a it's a, actually a, a very good remark that you make uh classical music is all, all about uh, trying to be as exact as possible within within and, that, and then within the exactness you can improvise but you can't change notes because that's from the composer in jazz it's also about structure but it's about you what are you adding to it this is this is this is the melody line this, this is this is the harmonic system but what do you do with it and in jazz if you play i of course this is black and white uh, but this is not not uh, i think per se always to but in jazz if you play all the notes right you're doing it wrong but in, in classical music if you play all the notes wrong you do you're doing it wrong so that's already an interesting part for me and what i what i like about non western music is this fact that the improvisation the the addition of the person itself that is performing on that moment in time it's it's a uh, it's 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 way more important than we do in in western music we tend to look for reproduction like you play a concert on friday and you play the same concert on saturday and you play it exactly the same or, or more or less the same that's something which in jazz is considered to be a bad thing and i think in again black and white it's not it's not entirely true uh, in classical music it's considered to be a good thing and it's the same with i we we, we talked about coldplay earlier we talked about uh, let's say taylor swift that all also you see a sort of a thing people pay money to be entertained and therefore the show has a sort of a certain rhythm. i don't think that taylor swift changes her setlist every night no it's 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 exactly the same from start to finish and they perfection the reproduction part of it and the creative part is on beforehand whilst in in jazz or or in or in uh african or other startup music the creativity is, is in the moment and that's a different approach to to things I, i'm not saying the one is good and the one is bad but that's that's what we do even a solo in a in a taylor swift concert or, or in whatever it's not improvised it's exactly third two measures it's on that position on stage because the lighting needs to be there and you need to be gone by i don't know what because then uh, another another instrument will appear on top of it and that's very similar on on how we treat music beautiful comparison between jazz and traditional music how it is done in india i love to ask my mom because i have heard references of people telling like what have you added to this in their own terminologies and also they are very like they practice try to be similar and something so that'll be something to explore mm-hmm. if you are a music listener to drop drop comments on that in uh, in, in the comments below coming to reading music you you said about those bars and those things and your you also created new scores which is for sheet music and which 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 is like a stock how do you explain um new scores I, th- i think what we wanted to solve with new scores are actually two things uh, first of all uh, when we formed the company it was already 2010 or so something like that what we saw was all all of our lives were going digital you could buy a car online a house online a book online uh, a tv set online everything was evolving towards online except that one thing that we loved music and for western music you need sheets you need paper to to, to perform and so the 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 situation back then was if you wanted to buy uh, a piece of paper with music on it from from your favorite composer or, or for your instrument you had had to go to a physical store or you had to order it and by mail and then wait 10 20 30 40, 40 days whilst if you want, wanted to buy music back then you went on iTunes and later on Spotify and you got immediately what you want for sheet music there was not something like iTunes back in the days second thing our consumption changed from uh being uh on paper to being on screens one time your mobile phone other time your ipad your laptop so uh one format so fixed on paper wasn't good enough anymore so we needed to change also the format of the music so what we did is we did two things first of all we made a marketplace for sheet music they of course where suppliers of rights could securely sell to users of rights and secondly we reinvented a format which was changing to the screen size so if you want to read a score on your ipad because of a different approach than on your than on your television and so on and so on the last thing that we added there was a lack of 
uh, um, let's say, editing possibilities. For instance, it was not good enough to just to sell PDFs because a PDF is a fixed form, but the musician needs to be able to write on the sheet music, say, okay, this has to be a little bit quicker, this has to be slower, I don't play this note, and so on and so on. So there's a lot of editing going on during rehearsal, and a PDF was simply at that moment in time not, not, not good enough. So that's what we formed. We formed the eh, what we call the iTunes for sheet music, where on the one hand, our clients were large companies, your Warners, your Sonys, your, your, uh, so the, the rights holders, the people who owned the rights to the music and to the, to the notation. And we made a marketplace, we made a format to then sell it to consumers. So if, if let's say you're a, you're a trumpet player and you wanted to play a specific piece that you don't, didn't know eh, that you had, didn't have at the time, that you don't need it to get on your bike and go to the store, order it, and then wait four weeks, that you can immediately on the spot uh, download it uh, on your iPad or whatever you, uh, you wanted to, to be using. That was, um, that was the main idea. And I am pulling up some sheets that I found online. If you could take us through and how we can really actually understand how Western music is to be read as well as um, how new scores is modernizing it. So this is uh, Moonlight Sonata, I believe. Yeah. Well, uh, let's make my skit a little bit bigger here. Do you see it? Yeah. So this is a, this is a, a piano score. Uh, and so... Or maybe let's... what we can do is um, you can share one from your uh, or from your PC. You can do a ah, screen share and show because no, then you'll no, have a control on the mouse. Uh, let me see if I can quickly find something. I'll take the same example. And even the website of Neos course. Yeah, I'm I'm not actively with the company anymore, so I I, oh, I, okay. I quit the company, and uh, I I don't know if, if they're still active as as of today. That's something I don't. Uh, but this is a, a competitor of of Neos course, which I can I can I can show you the same. Uh, let me just. Yeah. I remember Whiplash, that music on jazz, uh, that movie on jazz, uh, Whiplash, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he the importance of knowing how to read the music and if you if you you see my screen right now yes okay so yeah it's a, this is a typical a typical score uh, and what also what what the neo scores did so you have uh, five lines and so this is the the key so this uh, i i don't see a zoom inversion i'm just seeing um ah. what do you say the google ah, search wait, wait um Now you should see. Okay, now I see. Yes. Right. So this is a, a, a typical score. This is the piece, the Moonlight Sonat, by uh, but not by Beethoven by Glenn Miller. And so what you see here is a piano part. So uh, the the lower stuff here, that's your left hand, and this here is your right hand. And so yeah, you have five lines. So that's uh, how you have to understand it. And here you see the the key. This is the first uh, symbol. And between the dots, that means this is the, the note F. So the second line, every time there is a note on the second line, you need to play an F. And so if the note is in between the lines, you get to a, uh, an E, and here you get a, like a D. Um, and so you have to read it. So your, your left hand plays this part, and your right hand plays the, the above part. But it's now the beauty of uh, digital sheet music instead of paper. If I push here, I don't know if you hear it. Yeah, I can hear. What you need to play. And this was very similar to what Neil's course was doing. So we made the sheet intelligent. So uh, if you're on a PDF, uh, yeah, you can't listen to the music. You can't understand what it's doing. If you make it digital, you can add these extra layers of content to it. And you can help the, uh, uh, you as a player. Uh, that, was, that was, I think, the main difference. So in, in ex your exercise in the music, became way easier but it's mainly the buying process that we wanted to uh, to accelerate and to make uh, make uh, make better and faster amazing beautiful like to be actually able to hear the sound as you're playing because when you're trying to teach yourself because we have the tools available you can you can learn a lot of things quickly 
mm-hmm. and the the lines and the notation you showed they are the same are they the same for all instruments and yeah, it, uh, it depends on the instrument of course it's, it's it's i think it's of course very difficult to explain uh, all of western music theory in, in in the time that we have right now but what you I, tip- I, what you typically have is you have a key, uh, which is crucial for the instrument, like like a high key or a low key, uh, depending on, on on the instrument. And then some typical stuff. For instance, I'm a, I'm a trombone player, so I, I I play trombone. And so what you often have is above the note or below the note, the position that you need to play it in the note. Uh, if you're a piano player, the figure you need to play uh, the note with. If you're a guitar player, the position of your fingers on the guitar, uh, how to, how to how to play it. So there is a lot of extra information on on uh, on the sheet. So if Mozart was there today, I mean, for a composer, he has to write so many sheets and so many uh, instruments, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. How difficult would that job be? <laughs> it's a difficult job. It's a very difficult job, and it's it's uh, it's not by coincidence that composer is now. It's a sep- uh, back in the days you were like a musician, and you played music, you composed music, and so on and so on. But during the time, it has become so difficult. And a composer today not only needs to understand music theory, also needs to understand how to write it down, but also needs to understand how to how to add like electronic music to it, how to how to do it in the studio. So the 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 f- for me, a composer has not only become a a, a sort of like a, like a writer, like a thinker of of worlds, but also has a, a sort of a very technical part to it, how to make sure. And it's be performed in the best way possible. And as with every notation system, every notation system has good points and bad points. For instance, the Western uh, system is really bad at notating improvisation. And so there are other systems which which use other techniques uh, that are way better. You have to you have to know um, the the reason that we have five lines uh, in the in in, uh, in the Western notation system comes from the very first uh, way of, of treating uh, music. And that's it's called the hand of Guido of Arezzo, which has been found in it, Italy in the 14th century, where there was a music teacher that uses his hand for the notes, saying, okay, this is C, D, E, F, G. And that's why we have these five lines in the, in the, in the that's, that's, that's still the thing. But there are different ways of notating. And again, if you look at non-Western notation, um, it's perhaps not exact, but it's way better at showing you how to do it, uh, how to how to be uh, emotional about it. The same with Western music. If we if we say something is soft, we say piano. If you say something is strong, it's say forte. But how 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 soft is soft? How how hard is hard? If you say on a score, play it allegro, which is like play it rather fast. How how fast is that? Is that the fastest that you can? Is that the fastest, uh, depending on where you are? If you play a piece of music in a cathedral with an echo of 10 seconds, probably you will play everything a little bit slower because if you play really fast, people in the hall don't understand. So there are limits to every rotation system. Uh, there is some very interesting fun facts that we got to know about Western music. In India, like my mom practices and all, Everything they verbalized, like even for tablas and the percussion instrument, you can remember it as a poem or as, as a song. Like I, verbally, yeah, everybody yeah. performs. Yeah. And what, what I what I know about it is also how you pronounce, like ticket, ticket, something stuff like that. How you pronounce it is how you do it. And, exactly. And and that's <laughs> something we don't do at all. Yeah. That's such such interesting uh, cultural aspects about the world. Uh, you said you are a trombone player. Do you have a trombone around that you could play for us? No, I'm no no. It's not here. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. It, it's at, at at home. Yeah. Okay, no problem. I'll we'll catch we'll ca- get on to you for that later on. This podcast is about art, entrepreneurship, and culture. So you mentioned that you're a culture manager. So what do you mean by culture manager? Yeah, I, I think it's it's for me. Um, it's it's what I always do or what I want to do is something which uh, has to do something with this combination of who we are today and what we were in the past. So culture in general. So it's every expression of an artist, be it on on a painting or be it in in a, in a 
uh, in music or in writing and in poetry. So what I typically like to do is work with those people who make and then those who make or those who are on stage performing, how to make sure that uh, they are heard or they are seen. So in a way, I'm, I'm a marketeer. I'm, I'm, I'm helping those who make uh, be heard or be seen. Um, it's also for me, uh, I like the word manager in it because yeah, it's what my role is. It's, it's a, a really humble, I'm really important in the process, but I'm not important for the results. I'm managing it. I'm making sure that everything runs smoothly. Uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, um, I, I get a lot of energy from a good concert. I also get a lot of energy from a good board of directors where they had a budget which was within budget on time. So that, that's the, the, those two phases. I'm, I'm not saying I never could work in, let's say, in a bank or let's say work in a, on a farm or stuff like that. But if my my if people ask me what what do you, what do the, what do I need to do with my life, I always say, if you have the chance of yeah of the, the luck of having a passion, yeah, go for it. I'm not saying you need to work in your passion because there are people that are perfectly happy with a, a passion for horses and then work in a, as an accountant. But, but you can perfectly separate one of, one of the two of them. But for me personally, my choice is I need to work for situations, places, places, and people that are passionate about what I'm passionate about. And that's what that was my choice in life. Um, that doesn't make it always easy because it's really difficult to deconnect. It's really difficult to not care about what I'm doing. Uh, but on the on the on the other hand, yeah, that's how I want things to be. I want to be. Uh, uh, the, the, the simple fact that I'm now in an office and 20 meters to my right here is our concert hall. And whenever I want, I can step in listening to those beautiful musicians playing beautiful music. That's something, that's my drugs. That's what I, that's what I need to be, to be happy. Uh, and I can't see it uh, anywhere else. But coming back to my role, that's what I do. Um, I try to be a bridge between something I know, which is beautiful, and people that either already know that or don't know it and how to connect those two. And that means that sometimes I need to talk like a manager. I need to talk to a bank, to an accountant, to a, to a, a government, whatever, and, and making sure that the KPIs are met. But it also means that, I, that I'm there to explain to society to why it's important that we, that we keep our culture and our heritage alive uh, and not throw it away. Uh, sometimes you have this discussion in the symphony orchestra, why do we need it? It's 2023. And then my reply is simply, uh, why do we need uh, ancient Greek statues? Why do we need to preserve churches? Why do we need to preserve? But uh, there is a beautiful quote by Gustav Mahler about uh, heritage and about, uh, about um, culture. It's never ever about, uh, how to say it in English, uh, to translate it right. It's about giving through the spirit, not uh, um, um, worshiping the ashes. So uh, it's if you have a fire, yeah, give the fire through, not take a look at what has been there. It's it's of no use to keep uh, a sort of a, a tradition going if nobody is interested anymore. But what you is important for me is to keep the tradition alive. And every year that you advance in, in life and society, add something to it, add a layer to it, remove stuff. It's 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 a discussion that we have right now uh, a lot here in Belgium about colonialism. And it's a really it's a difficult it's a difficult debate because we are talking about something which in our specific case has already been in our past like it's it has been seventy or eighty years or so that we have don't have a colony anymore. But what do we Belgians of today what do we have to do in order to make right for the mistakes of the people that lived one hundred years ago, without saying ah oh, we're so sorry and we'll pay back every yeah that's in the past. But what do we need to do? in order to avoid in the future that we make the same mistakes. Uh, and that's what I, I think tradition is. You have to make sure that there is a, a moment in our past where some horrible things happened, some really good things happened, how to make sure that we, that we put it in the right context and how to add the layer of today. And for me, it's not uh, totally similar, but it, it's, it's comparable to, to what, what we need to do in, in music as well. What do we keep? What do we throw away? Or what do we do not throw away, but say, okay, this is not acceptable anymore. And that's, I think, where I, where I come into place because 
you need a certain type of, of, of knowledge or a certain type of, of understanding of different worlds, different cultures, different positions in life to, to explain that well. You, 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 can't, you can't count on the arts alone or on the artist alone to do that. You need somebody there as a bridge, as a translator, as a diplomat, as a, as a, a marketeer to, to, to make sure that everybody understands what we're talking about. I, I, that's at least my uh, my humble opinion. <laughs> talking about colonialism, it was just last week we had a colony of Belgium, Democratic Republic of Congo. Yeah. We had a lady from there. You can see the episode in the oh, thing yeah. that pops up here. So she was. Ta- we were talking about languages in the country and the Belgium and uh, that. Mm-hmm. So yeah, very interesting. I'm on a mission to talk to guests from every country of the world, and glad to have. Congo and Belgium, one after the other. Yeah. So, you were saying that you uh, you need somebody to control art or make because artists are usually disruptive, right? But you said that there has to be somebody who needs to see in which in which angle they are going. So why? It's it's you know again this is a, this is a debate with a lot of new ones. I'm I'm never there to control an artist, never. I think the artist is free. That's 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 the main premise. Uh, and once you step into the role of yeah, you can't do that or you can't say that or, or uh, watch out with this, it's 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 uh, dangerous because that's a road. If you take it wrong, it ends up in in totalitarianism and it ends up in in in, uh, in censorship. And I, I don't want that. This set, um, yeah. Uh, being free does not mean that you don't have responsibilities, and and that's that's for me where where, where I think my role comes into place uh, is to help structure, to help understand, and to help be effective about it. Because l- let me put it this way: uh, it's not true that all artists are like hairs in the wind and writing poetry at night with a bottle of wine. So this image of the romantic artist, yeah, that's not true. The artists that I know of, the good artists that I know of. They are craftsmen, they are entrepreneurs, and they are they have a goal in life. They want to get to some point in their arts or whatever. Also, artists are humans. Uh, if we if we limit ourselves to a view of this this artist as a oh wow so much inspiration, those people <laughs> need to pay for houses, they need to educate children, they need to be able to buy cars, so they they they, they need to be able to be a part of society. And uh, I think. You can count on the artists themselves because the, the the smartest people that I know are artists. But that's what I what, what I'm here for. For them to be the best at being an artist, they need to be able to focus, and that's where I step in to help to help uh, get to that point of focus. But it's different for every uh, artist, for every type of artist, and even for every type of sort of arts. For instance, an orchestra, as we are now here, I uh, sometimes I say to people who don't understand. An orchestra is like having 100 electricians. Those are skilled people, but in order for them to work together, they need to be planned. And they need to be planned one or two years ahead. Uh, And the cost of an orchestra is the same cost as asking 100 electricians to come to your home at Saturday evening. That's the cost of an orchestra. And what you pay for is not that one hour that the electrician is at your home. You pay for the experience. And so some orchestras, to get the level that you are accepted in our orchestra, that you win an audition with us, you are the best of the best of the best. So uh, we had an audition two or three weeks ago for uh, for violin. Uh, we had over 200 candidates. We had one job open. So what you see is out of 200, we select, I don't know, first 50, then 10, and so on and so on. I can assure you the first 10 are excellent violin players, but we only need one. So uh, when we pay or we choose for one musician, we don't pay for the hours that he's on stage. We pay for the hours the years before, and that's that's how I think you should you should see it. And that's you can apply that to everything. Uh, let's take the electrician as an example. There are fantastic electricians and there are really bad ones. And for me, the good ones. Why are they different from the bad ones? Because at one moment in time, they studied harder, they worked harder, and they had more luck or whatever, more circumstances that were right. And that's for me. Uh, that's a very similar uh, approach to doing things. And it's also for me, the way how I explain it to people that are not per se convinced that you need an orchestra, 
in order for us to keep our heritage alive, to be able to keep on playing the Mozarts and the Beethovens and the Brahms, you need such a high level of experience that it also comes with a cost. In order for us to be uh, able to continue to show to future generations what past generations have done, you need a tool like an orchestra full time to to do so. That's that's how uh, at least how I see it. Yes, live mu live museum, and I can imagine how much training and practice it takes to reach there. You talked about costing. How much? What is a ticket for uh, your orchestra, like for the audience? We uh, what we what we do here is we have this uh, uh, a large part of our funding comes from the government, so we get subsidies to do our job, whatever you can do, and with that comes also a politics uh, in in your ticket sales. So we don't sell the tickets at even cost. The cheapest ticket is around nine twelve euros here. If you see that the average person in Belgium earns around I don't know two thousand euros or so, in fact we're rather cheap. Our most expensive ticket is shall be around 40 45 euros even there you see it's very much doable to come to come uh, to come to to one of our concerts 45 so, euros yeah, only that, yeah so that's but that's that's a political decision yeah, the idea being if we use tax money for an orchestra it should be accessible for all taxpayers or for all people uh, in in the neighborhood but the downside of that is uh, that it's not an economic model. It's it's a, a societal model where you say this is important. It needs to be as cheap as possible. But therefore, the the economic system of an orchestra is is kaput. It's broken because the the actual cost of putting an orchestra there, let alone uh, uh, lighting our hall and making sure it's it's on temperature and everything. So the actual cost of doing what we do does not reflect at all in the price we ask for it. At all. How much? How much does it cost? Yeah, it, we we have a turnover of of uh, around fifty million euros a year, out of which fifteen like, million euros. Yeah, wow! Like, like for in, and out of that, around around ten million euros is subsidies. So, so, so if if you want to, if you want to reflect the actual cost of the ticket sales, we should triple or quadruple or quintuple our ticket prices, and it's it's worth so, it all with opera. One show. How much does it cost to do one show for you? Yeah. Two hundred thousand euros, three hundred thousand euros. Yeah, three hundred thousand euros. Yeah, and how much? What is the capacity of the or the one thousand one hundred? Hundred people. One thousand one hundred. Yeah, but yeah, it's it's okay. It's, it's, you it's can a, divide and drop the cost in the description. Per yeah, seat. but it's 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 a difficult thing to compare because, of course, in order for us to be performing a a, a concert, you need one hundred skilled musicians, and in order for to have them. You need to pay them a salary, and so so it's it's very difficult to have a cost breakdown on a, on a single concert because that's that's of no use. It's a, you you pay for for the total. That's what that's what you pay for, and there are other models. So I'm I'm not saying it's it's the only model, but I do think in order for in this case Western European culture to, to survive and to have good symphony orchestras, government or a funding body other than the market needs to be there. I think it's a typical product where the market doesn't work that well it's it's a typical thing it's like like a hospital the who who calculates the actual if unless you're american i think there you pay what it actually costs because of the poor healthcare but everybody else has centralized healthcare because because subsidized what 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 what, what is the price of a, of a of a human life if you go to the hospital, you want you want to be cured. So you you don't want to you don't expect us to be expected to heroes. That doesn't mean that we don't need to uh, be fully accountable and trying to make the worst the, the most of our, our our subsidy money. We we try to have a return on society as much as we can. Every euro that we receive, we try to get the most out of it. But if you want to educate young people, for if you go to schools, we go to schools for free because we really say this is crucial that we are present in schools. And if you start asking money to go to schools, yeah, you exclude a lot of people. Uh, and, and, and that's, that's you see, that this is where the, the friction comes in between return on investment. We are a bad investment. If a government invests in, in, in a civil orchestra, it loses money. But in return on society, I think we are a fantastic investment. And that's, that's how you should, you should defer. 
I think it's a good time to transition to Belgium as we're talking about subsidies yeah. and all that. So, um, subsidies are a good model, right? You can, you can have, it makes it accessible for so many people and some things which are ancient can spark interest because it's just, it is accessible and you can just go and taste it. Uh, you do not have anything to lose. Belgium has one of the highest taxes in the world, like about 50% or so. <laughs> mm-hmm. So these taxes are funding what things? Like what are the what are the public benefits that you get in Belgium for paying fifty percent of your salary as tax? Yeah, it's a very 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 good question. <laughs> uh, I think uh, in in a way what what you what you get is uh, let's let's take it on the European level first. So I think in Europe we generally pay a lot of taxes in return we get or we ought to get a government that works so that you feel safe on the streets that if something happens to you that you're covered and that uh, if you're uh, not able to contribute to society you can go into social welfare and you can you can actually be helped so uh, the the main difference i see for and and i i can't compare to uh non-Western cultures, because I, I, I've traveled the world a little bit. I've, I've been in, in Asia and so on, but it's, it's, I, my, my knowledge is not enough. So what I can compare it to is like the American system. There I can see, if I look at my American counterparts in the orchestras, they earn a lot more. So if, if ever I move to America, my salary will be times four, times five, times six, I think. But what I lose is security. And I think that's, that's, that's the idea in the European model. You pay a lot of taxes in return, you get security back. Uh, this said, I do, I do think as a Belgian, but I think everybody thinks that, that I pay too much taxes, and uh, that that the return that I see uh, is, is not what I expect. For instance, where, where I live, Antwerp, and where I work, Liège, is like a one-hour drive. If I drive from my hometown to here, the roads for European standards are horrible. Like there are there are potholes everywhere, and and I I've got. Uh, if I if I have to move around Brussels, I'm I'm uh, I'm in traffic jams all day. So, government is not functioning that well, and I feel that for what I pay and what I receive, there is some disbalance. Same applies if you're uh, uh, if you pay taxes here, you're with the happy ones who can contribute, to, you can you can work. There is a sentiment which which I'm not sharing per se, but what, which is that that if you don't work, you're better off. So the the, the system invites you to not contribute because people that are working are paying for the, those that are not working. So that's a downside. But to, to wrap it up, because it's, it's, it's very easy to come into this uh, black and white stuff. And that, that's something I, I never like. I like new ones. I like, I like, uh, I like, uh, uh, I like it to be, to be, uh, to uh, for my opinion based on all different sources. I, I do feel we pay a lot to not per se get a lot of in, in return. But it's easy to say if you're in the heart of Europe, which we have seen war in, in 80 years or so. And I'm, I'm, I think in, I, I don't want to be in Ukraine right now. You see? So it's a very interesting fact that you mentioned. It's, it's better to be unemployed. So yeah, the subsidies that's... help you that, right? How many years does the government support if you're unemployed? Like government actually gives out money if you're unemployed, right? Uh, yeah, I think, I, I don't know. I, I think it's, Two years and then it goes down. I think, uh, yeah. It's by the way, it's not a lot. If you're unemployed, you can't go on holidays. Eh? It's the, you, you get you get you get enough to not die. That's what's the, what what you get get for. But it's a good thing, you know. If ever they want to fire me here, I know I I will not be without money. I just have to go to the government and then. Uh, and so the idea of the system is that if you are unemployed, that you are three, four, five months unemployed. I don't know, and that you can get to another job. But I'm not an expert on 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 uh, on, uh, on on unemployment tariffs and uh, yeah. I've but it's a it. it's an interesting question to ponder upon. I would love to see your the comments in description. What if more than fifty percent of the country just goes unemployed because the government is taking care? What would happen to the economy? Yeah, I, drop I, it in the comments. <laughs> I want to ask uh, uh, next question to you. Education system is also subsidized, right? How? Yeah. Till what age do you get free education? Uh, it's not totally free. It's like, uh, I think if you go to, to high school, you pay around 100, 200 euros a year for high school. If you go higher education, it's around 1,000 euros, I think, per year. 
uh, and I, if I'm not mistaken, it's uh, whenever you go to study, yeah, it's subsidized. There, there are some private schools, like 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 always, but typically we say it's the role of the government to provide good education, good healthcare, good education, good security. That, that those are the three the three main roles of, of the government. Uh, and I think our education system is of, of very high level. One one thing where, what people typically say about Belgium is that our languages are really good. Uh, we are we are in the in the center of Europe. Brussels is the capital of Europe. Therefore, a lot of what we do, a lot of our welfare, a lot of our uh, what what we are as a company comes from import export. So we're a really open economy. Therefore, a lot of Belgians speak at least two to three languages. I I speak personally. I speak four or five languages. Five, yeah. Uh, and so typically our English is rather good, our German is rather good, our French is rather good. And in my case, my Dutch is also, uh, it's my mother language. So that's, that's something, uh, and that stems from our education system, which from the beginning focuses on being a, a good, a good, good, good connector. It's also, the country is so small, you have to be open. Uh, it's, it's, it's silly to say, uh, uh, if, if, uh, if, if you're like a German uh, guy or girl, you can say, yeah, Germany alone. Because that's a, a big enough of a market, but that's something which Belgian, Belgian people can never say. You called it the capital of Europe, so I'd read that it is the capital of European Union and a couple of more other organizations that yeah. run Europe. Yeah, that's uh, that's a good pun fact. It's, it's it's also a capital of Europe, and that's also historical because uh, if you're a German and you want to form Europe, and Paris is the capital. Back in the days, with all the nationalism going on, yeah, that was simply not not something you would expect. And so Brussels is is, is ideally placed in between all of those big big countries. We are we were back then not important enough, but therefore also not not uh, not not uh, it, it's it's good so, place to be. Yeah, yeah, capital of uh, ancient warfare is like battlefield, and also now the capital which governs yeah. of the governing body because it's neutral. Very interesting. What do you love the most about your country? Uh, what, what I what I like about uh, Belgium is is yeah, this fact that we are really on the crossroads of 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 Western European cultures. We have this the, I think I think our food is fantastic, and that's that's the French influence. I think I think the the Belgian cuisine is better than the French, even though everybody international says yeah, French cuisine is the best in, the, in Europe. I don't don't think that's that's true. I think Belgium is is. Uh, more refined i think it's that's that's really good I, talking I, about french and belgium i had read that french fries was actually invented in belgium yeah so that that's but that, that's that's a typical thing it should have been called belgian fries because it's it's clearly a, a belgian invention but as as you see I, I i like the fact that being a belgian it doesn't do anything with me it's like yeah i'm born here my postal code happens to be in belgium uh I, when I, when I introduce myself, I, I will probably say I'm from that. I'm, I'm from Antwerp. That's that's for me. Really, my town is really important. Mm -hmm. I'm from Europe. I, I I like the fact that I'm that I'm a product of my environment. That I'm that I'm based in this European culture, which I like a lot. So I think if that, that's that's my my frame, uh, sta stating that I'm, I'm I'm French or I'm, yes, I'm, I, you know, it doesn't say anything to me. Because of being in such a multicultural place, you you are in unisync or you feel connected to so many different aspects. My next question to you is, if there was one thing you could change about your country, what would that be? I I think what we uh, this this fact with the language barrier uh, that that we have uh, we have a, a government which is too complex. We are a country of ten million. We actually we have six governments for ten million people. That's too much. If you if you look at like like India, I don't I know my one one billion and a and a half Indians. We have one government. This doesn't mean that all Indians are the same. Of course, there is a huge difference. I think between the north and the south. Only in kilometers, that's already a big difference. But we as a country, we are so small, and we we try to divide it even up in smaller parts. That's something I I don't like. So the complexification of of, of that. The second thing that I that I I, I I dread one thing. One thing. Oh, one thing. Only one thing. Okay, that, that's uh, the one thing. That's the one thing. <laughs> yes. What is your favorite festival of your country? Oh. Yeah, I have I have to say Tomorrowland. So it's non-classical. It's a dance festival near where I live. I think that's that's a fantastic festival. 
because what they do there it's not about the music it's about the experience the the way you are treated as a customer it's it's uh, for me next level i i love it even though i'm not a fan of the music but the the festival experience is is if ever you have the money and the time and you have to go to one festival in europe go to tomorrowland how much would it cost a lot <laughs> it's really expensive <laughs> Yeah, yeah. How much is the entry fees for? Uh... I, I think it starts at three, four hundred euros. I think, uh, but I think the most oh, expen- wow. most expensive tickets are like thirty, forty, fifty thousand euros. But if you can afford it, it's worth your while. It's really a fantastic festival. It's a land of music festivals, right? A lot of music festivals happening. Absolutely, that's something we're world world leader in. Absolutely, yeah. I I noticed this when I'm asking on the podcast. When I ask about festivals, people usually say arts and music festival, but the connotation of festival in India is a little different. It is it is traditional festivals like Diwali, which is the festival of lights. There is Holi, which is the color of uh, what do you say? Uh, festivals of colors. So what? How should I ask a European about a traditional ritual or festival that they have been doing? Like, how would you ask that? a good question um yeah and i think there what you see is there is there is this uh religion used to be very important in europe it's not anymore i i, I like the i like that fact i think religion is is something if you're religious good for you i think it's really good for you but what i see is it has moved away from 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 being important uh so a lot of traditions that we have have religion in the base but are not anymore uh, this set, I, I don't think we have this. We have, of course, Christmas. We have, we have Easter. We have this, this, the, the, the big. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily need to be religious, right? It can be just cultural or just that group of people doing it, like Oktoberfest in Germany or something like that. Yeah, but I, what I what I think, what I what I would like to see is is uh, the idea of coming together around food that's for me a european a european thing and around four or five o'clock like the aperitif that's what, what what we call it here but what, what you also oktoberfest for me that's so typically german i i <laughs> i don't feel anything about it I, of course i want to go one day but it's it's for me it's not it's not european i, I understand yeah, yeah that, exactly I, Exactly, that's a German thing, right? So I was wondering if there was something like this for yeah. Belgium. Uh, but yes, Tomorrowland is a festival, new new festivals, and uh, of course, we will welcome all kind of festivals. Mm-hmm. Next question is about wedding rituals. So every culture around the world has typical some unique aspect that is there for the weddings because this is something which is relatable to everybody on alive. So, what is one unique wedding ritual that happens oh. only in Belgium? I, again, I think my reply will be uh, there isn't. I think Belgium doesn't have this. We, as we are a mixture of cultures, and we 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 do everything. Let's say fifty years ago, typical was like a huge feast, like five courses, everybody together. But that's not anymore. It's it's now. I if I look at my friends' weddings or my own wedding, everyone is different. We don't have this overarching culture. I went to Muslim weddings. I went to uh, Jewish weddings. I went to uh, atheist weddings what what you tend to see is is uh, there is no overarching culture there and i think it, it I, unless i'm 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 not well informed but typically belgium is that there is no big tradition it's like do as you please <sighs> you talked about atheist wedding now i'm very curious what happens in an atheist wedding it's that that's the thing i think it's very comparable to a jewish wedding or to whatever there's a couple that loves one another being a man, woman, or man, man, or woman, woman, whatever, that doesn't that doesn't matter. And you just come together with either your family or your friends, and you have a you have a party. But the the type of party I've been to weddings in the morning, I've been to weddings in the evening, I've been to weddings with a lot of food, I've been to weddings with no food at all, I've been to weddings with a DJ, with a live band, I've been to weddings in the church. So the, do as you please. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's really. I I think what what I like about Belgium is that whenever something gets too serious, we say, "Hey, wait a minute! No, 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 no! Just, 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 just uh, uh, calm, calm. It's okay. Uh, no, no big words. No, no, uh, nothing too much. Just, just do normal. That's what I think uh, I like about it. <laughs> what is the best local food that everybody must try? 
uh, Belgian fries, without the shadow of a doubt. And it's it's a, perhaps if you're a meat eater with what we call stoflees, it's like a stew with beer in it. It's it's delicious. Yeah, yeah. So you, you have you have meat of a uh, like like uh, 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 good good guy. Uh, uh, yeah, like like meat. You put in some beer, you let it stew for four or five hours, and then you get like a very intense, uh, good taste. Then what is it called? I'll add the image here. Yeah, uh, stove blaze, uh, like 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 Belgian Belgian beef stew. Okay, that's that's a typical. And thing. and everybody knows about waffles, and Belgian waffle has become a flavor and a brand. Yeah. So how different or same is it from what we get in the world? Like we get pizzas everywhere, but it's a little different in Italy. So how are, how are waffles? And you said it's invented in your city. So tell us more about it. It's also there again. It's typical Belgian. It depends on where you're from. So people from Brussels say the Belgian waffle is the Brussels waffle. The people from Liège say, no, 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 no. The Belgian waffle is the Liège waffle. And so every every region has his type of waffle. The, the main idea being it's like pastry that you put in the machine. You push it together, a lot of sugar on it, and then, then you serve it. But the way you eat it, it's like, for instance, in the town here, I know five, six waffle houses, each saying, this is the one. This is the original Waffle, it's sometimes with cinnamon, it's something with sugar, it's something with chocolate. So again, there, there is no uniform, like 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 pizza is pizza. It's round, it's with tomato sauce, it's well, it's like recognizable. Uh, if you if you uh, that that's not, not something I think we 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 have. But there, there are two styles, like Brussels and 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 and, and the ice. Those are the two the two main. The main. I I haven't had a lot of uh, waffles, but can you call it as? Um... Grilled pancakes is can you? <laughs> it's more like a, a grilled sandwich. I think that's better. Like 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 pancake is is too fluffy. A, a waffle is like like not hard, but it's like you have a you have a bite in it. That's that's what I think okay. a waffle is. Yeah. Okay, it's very thick. So I've seen a very flat ones. Yeah. So that's why you need to go to Belgium and yeah. try those. Okay. What is the best activity that everybody must do? In Belgium, you mean? Uh, I think I think our historic cities. I think that's the best thing you could do. There are, we have a, um, like Antwerp, Ghent, uh, Brussels. If you're lucky, you are in a place that has been there for already thousand or more years, so you can really see everything from medieval to today. And what I also like is about Belgium. It's a little bit ugly because we don't have this this overarching idea. But you see a lot of different styles next to one another, and you see um, people of tomorrow, people of today, people of, of yesterday, actually being around and living together. And I think that's what I like about uh, Belgium: um, the cities. Like, absolutely, yeah, tour yeah. for the city, see the architecture and history. Yeah. Awesome. But that's also my personal preference. If you want to go to nature, we have beautiful nature as well. But I think what makes Belgium unique is <laughs> our cities. And don't forget to go to the orchestra. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. That's given. <laughs> we we spoke about waffles, but Belgium is also known for chocolates. Mm-hmm. How did that craze come in? I'm pretty sure chocolate is not grown in Belgium. Oh, absolutely not. Um, I actually I don't know. Um, I don't know. The, here again, <laughs> that's 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 typical Belgium. Our our own culture. We like yeah, whatever. We, I don't know. I really don't know. Probably the colonists uh, went and got these funny beans and tried yeah. to cook things here. Can, uh, can well imagine that that's the, that's the thing. Uh, <laughs> I, I think it has something to do with the fact that we have two harbors, Antwerp and, and Bruges, which are the entry gates to Europe. So it's not uncommon that if a, a foreign product comes in, that we are the first market to try it out. I think that has perhaps something to do with um, with this, but to 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 why we are the chocolate country I, I don't know what is your favorite chocolate my cotton d'or that's by definition it's like the i've uh, like the gold coast of africa we have this we have this company called cotton d'or so it's a french a french word for gold can coast. you spell it spell it i'll yeah. add a picture here c o t e and then d like a, a bracket um loud yeah o r cotton d'or okay so it is the best, and you also have several other kinds of uh, chocolates. Millions. And Antwerp is also known for diamonds, right? So how was it growing in Antwerp? 
<laughs> yeah, but but that's that's that for me uh, uh, that I can explain uh, Antwerp uh, being the main harbor to enter into Europe, diamonds coming from overall all over the world, especially from Africa. It's not abnormal that uh, you have this Antwerp community of, of diamond people. Uh, a lot of Jewish people in the diamond uh, uh, community. Uh, recently, if I'm well informed, a lot of Indian and Pakistani as well. So it's it's really becoming a, a global business. But Antwerp uh, has been a, a sort of a, a, ch- a change board for, for diamonds. Apparently, it's the same for bananas. I think uh, Belgium accounts for 80% of import-export of bananas. Uh, there are some products which the Antwerp harbor is ideally for. I think we are the largest or second largest har- harbor of, of, of Europe. Uh, and that's not abnormal that a lot of products are associated with Belgium, but it has to do with the fact that we have the biggest harbor. Shout out to my uh, brother, cousin brother, who's in jewelry, and he he told me a few stories of Antwerp. So yeah, cool to yeah. Uh, be talking somebody to from there. For a moment, now I want to do. I want you to do something. Please close your eyes. Mm-hmm. Think of your favorite memory, and explain it to me in your mother tongue. <laughs> Ik moet terugdenken aan de eerste keer dat ik een orkest hoorde met mijn moeder en mijn vader in de doel in Rotterdam. Uh, Stravinsky was dat, denk ik, uh, een orkest en ik was totaal uh, overrompeld door de schoonheid van de muziek. There you go. Awesome. So, now what did you say and what language was it in? It's, it was in Dutch, yeah, of course. Uh, and uh, I told about the first time that I remember that I, uh, my parents took me to a lot of concerts, of course. And I clearly remember a time before and a time after a specific concert, before I couldn't care less. They, they took me and I was like, yeah, whatever, I have to go to a stupid concert. And I remember uh, in, in, uh, in the Doelen, which is a concert hall in, in, uh, in Rotterdam in the Netherlands that I heard, I think it was Stravinsky, um, where I really felt like, Wow, this okay. This is the power of music. This is this well an orchestra, and that's that's one of my earliest things I, I remember. I don't know how old I was, but that's something I uh, I still fondly remember as it was as it was yesterday. First orchestra experience, and yeah. now you are uh, the secretary general in an orchestra. So I can understand the significance of it. That's how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> wow. What are your impressions about India? I, I honestly have to know, I don't know a lot of India. I, I know who your prime minister is, because that's something you see in the news. I, I know a little bit of the food. Uh, I do know that it's a country um, that there is no one India, uh, in, my, in my appreciation of the facts. I think it, it matters a lot where you come from. I also, um, um, for me, there are two types of India. There is the industrialized big city India where the future of the world has been written and there is the very rural part of India as well. This set, uh, that's how far my knowledge goes. It's it's really, it, it's, it's uh, I, I, I presume it's, it's the same with you guys if you look to Europe. If I ask you, please, uh, perhaps you can, because you're in this podcast, but if you ask an average Indian pinpoint where Norway is, it's really difficult, and I think it's for me the same. I think I can, uh, uh, I can. If, if you ask me where, where Mumbai is, I can more or less put it. But let's say the second city of India, I don't know what it is, let alone put it on the map. You know, it's interesting that you say it's a mixture of so many things. We have discussed that India is, is like Europe. It's as big as Europe actually, Absolutely. and each state. We have states uh, and they are as big as countries in India, which are segregated on the basis of language Mm -hmm. and culture. So that's very huge. It's like, you know, comparing it with Europe. And 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 let's say if I, if I, of course, you know, Mahatma Gandhi, that's, that's some, somebody, you know, I know Tata Steele, there are, there are some, some, the, like, like, uh, if you talk about America, you know, Barack Obama, you know, uh, Coca-Cola, it's so the, 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 the global things, you know, but it's for me yes. undiscovered. But it's it, the same applies for me for Africa. I, I, I don't know a thing about Africa. Latin America, for me, is the same. So the world is so big. I, there's so much to do. Give you one, I, I, I have a family. And if we go on holidays, there is so much to do. Fantastic stuff to be discovered in Belgium alone, in Europe alone. 
that we, we, we as a family, we decided, okay, let, let's first see that we maximize what we have here. And I'm, I'm very interested to get to know other cultures, to get to, to go yeah, to, to Thailand, to, to India, to Pakistan. Uh, but it's so much. And I have to say, uh, in my work, I've traveled a lot to the States. I've traveled a lot to China. And the, the, the shocks that you get every time that you go to this totally other culture, or, or to Russia for that matter, if, if in classical music, we tend to, we, uh, before the war, we had a lot of, a lot of contact with, with Russia. Already that is so different from what I know that it's simply a matter of, of prioritizing. And also, yeah, that's, that's the dance that India is far, far, far away from, from where I live. You know, that's one of the reasons for having, talking to people from all countries, I because can you can have people of local and people listening to the podcast can experience culture from the local person's point of view, not through the point of view of media or any propaganda or issues. It's just like talking to heart to heart to a citizen of uh, another place in the world and Absolutely. also showing it on the map, you know, where is this? <laughs> so uh, next question to you is, if you had, what, what's your favorite travel destination? If you had to go somewhere, where you would go? Uh, I'm a huge fan of the Nordics in Europe. So Oslo, uh, Copenhagen, Stockholm. For me, that's, that's the, I'm, it's not that, not that hot. The quality of life is, is fantastic over there and really well. Nature is, is impressive. The cities are of, of very high quality. And what I like about, uh, for instance, Oslo in this case, it's a very, Oslo is the, the capital of, of, uh, of uh, Norway. It's one of the richest places in the world. And yet Oslo is like 300,000 people. So the city itself feels like a village. It's walkable, it's doable. You get everything there of such high quality, fantastic opera, fantastic symphony orchestra, fantastic uh, jazz scene. Uh, everything is that. So it's on a, on a very small scale everything of extreme high quality. That's something I, I like. What I want to do is I, I'm huge. I'm interested in, in like Middle East, like Dubai, uh, Emirates. I want to go there. So uh, Oslo is something I know which I really go to. And if I, my dream is, is to go to, to East or Middle East, it attracts me. And, and, Absolutely. and for instance, like, like uh, China is something which, which I've been there all, five, six, seven times. Uh, first time, let's say in 2004, last time in 2000, what was it? Just before COVID. Okay, okay, one place. It was one place. I have a few more questions I need to <laughs> yeah, go ahead, go ahead. cover in time. So, uh, what is one less known fact about your country? Uh, the inventor of the saxophone is a Belgian. Oh, wow. Adolf yes. Sachs. So, literally, Adolf Sax, his last day became the name of the instrument. Wow. And uh, what is the story? How did you come up with this instrument when you already have so many other instruments? It's, it's really a funny story, actually, because he, he made the instrument on order. The French army asked for an instrument that was really loud outside, but really easy to play. And so Sax invented an instrument which was based on the clarinet, which was a, it's with a reed, but it's made of, of copper to sound really, really loud. And what I like about this idea of sax is it's, it's, uh, he made the instrument for the army, so to, to be played outside, to march and so on and so on. But he also uh, was at the start of a sort of an educational system. If you play saxophone, soprano until the lowest one, the bass saxophone, everybody who knows how to play soprano saxophone in principle can also, also play bass, bass saxophone. So it's really an instrument that has been uh, conceived to be a commercial success or to be an educational success. And so that's what I like about, about sax. He was in, in the beginning an artist, he made instruments, but he was also like a, an entrepreneur. He wanted something that he can sell and that he can uniform. And it's really in this tradition of industrialization that he made his instrument. And it's also compared to romantic songs, right? Like that, that's got that mm -hmm. uh, nuance. Or is that only in America or is it a romantic sort of instrument even in Europe and uh, I, I think, your I think, country? I think it's a complete instrument that can do a lot of uh, choices, but I, I, I agree that that especially the, the softer side of the, the sound of the sax, I, I, I like and it's, it's romantic, yeah. yeah absolutely. Awesome. I have one very interesting thing to show to the audience. I'll pull it up on the screen and you tell me why it has become a symbol.
Yeah, you go. Why do you think is the become a symbol, <laughs> national symbol of the country? Again, it's a uh, it's typical Belgium. We have this. Yeah, it's called <laughs> mannequin piss. It's like the, the 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 little guy who pees. It's a small statue in Brussels. It's it's if you go to it, it's a disappointment because it's really two times nothing. But it's for me typical, like a, it's like a Belgian symbol. Like yeah, just what 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 do we need? Yeah, just take the small guy that that that's that piece. Why not? And it, it has become a thing in Italy, as you see it. Uh, if we have a holiday, we we dress it up, uh, we change it over. If if the Belgium's Belgian soccer team uh, became uh, third in in the uh, what was it, the World Cup or European Cup, they dressed up as a Belgian soccer player. Uh, but that's that's for me a typical tourist trap thing. If you go to it, it's like, what is this? This is just yeah, you you walk across it. Uh, but that's that's a, a, a Brussels statue, yeah, indeed. That's very interesting. Dressing it up in so many different ways. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but why? Why like a peeing boy? Boy is peeing. Like, do you? I mean, what is the cultural or the creator? Why did the creator create, and how did it I, become so important to become a national symbol? I, I honestly, I you see again, I don't know. I, I think it's by coincidence, or, or, or uh, there is, the, as far as I'm concerned, there is no big story behind it. I think it's a. Uh, it happens to be there, and it happened at one point. It started to be photographed, and 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 all of a sudden it became a tradition. But but uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Beautiful. But what I can say there is also there is a female version as well. So two streets ahead, there is like a, a Janneke piece, which is called the the the, the 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 girl who piece, and that that's that's the less of known uh, 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 twin of it. Uh, I guess she's sitting sitting down. Yeah. Uh, And also, yeah, this one. Oh, <laughs> but you haven't dressed her up. No, it's, so, it's less unknown. But yeah, so and uh, I'm sorry. But and you yeah, have a dog whoopies. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's that's not so bad. But yeah, that's that's the thing. I I can't explain why it is. So I, I don't know the story behind it. <laughs> that's something very interesting. I also want to show images of cities in Belgium, which are very very beautiful. Mm -hmm. So this is which place? What um, so such colorful houses? That's either Ghent or Bruges, I think. And you're right opposite to the neighbors. Like, how do you? Isn't that a disturbance? Like to people around <laughs> you, if you knock or something happens. Ah, no, I don't think so. And it also, this is of course the the old the old towns, but I think Belgium in general there are a lot of different architectural periods. For instance, we have this uh, Horta in Brussels, Art Nouveau, which is beautiful as well. This is like more medieval or, uh, or Renaissance uh, building styles, but there are a lot of uh, a lot of fantastic. If you, if you look up the harbor building of Antwerp, that's really, uh, for me, uh, a very good example of, of uh, uh, modern building styles mixed with ancient building styles, uh, Zaha Hadid. Uh, yeah, that's the one, see? Oh, wow. So, so beautiful. This this is uh, in Antwerp. So this is uh, also a, a sort of a diamond shape style. Repeat Antwerp. It's also a ship. So this is the main the main seat of the Antwerp Harbor. Uh, there are there are a lot of lot of modern architectural stuff as well. And it's on top of a traditional building. Yeah. So that is even more it's, classy. This is for me a, a very good typical Belgian example of just mixing it together, just putting it together and, and see how it uh, how it goes. Amazing. I can't go and wait to see and maybe take a selfie there. Yeah. But uh, yeah, very interesting. This is another side of it. Yeah. You got to be there to check it out. All right. Now on to the signature round. These are some set of questions we ask everybody. Name three people, living or dead, that you would like to have lunch with. <laughs> um... Richard Strauss, the composer, I think that's one of my personal favorites. I really want to, uh, because I don't understand what his music was and what his personal life was. That's something I really want to know. Um, Beyonce, I think uh, she's also from 81, my birth year. I really would like to, uh, I, I, I like like how she's constantly reinventing herself as an artist. Uh, third one, um, I think one of the old Greek, uh, Plato. 
like like ancient thinkers i think that's also something which i would like to be uh, at the table uh, yeah so now so now you are on a lunch with them what is one question would you ask a question that hasn't been asked, how are you i think that's a question we should ask one another uh, quite quite more often what is what is you the person behind what you're uh, uh, of course, I would like to learn from Plato about his ideas, but I would also like to know about how how is life treating you, Plato? That's something I would like to know. Yeah. I'm interested in people. I'm interested in stories. That's what I what I want to know. What would you like to know from Beyonce? Um, from Beyonce, uh, I would I would like to know what she does herself uh, in, in all of her music. What 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 is Whenever you hear a song of Beyonce, you hear, yeah, this is Beyonce. But I would like to know, is, is she more of a, a team manager? Is she really writing the songs? I, I would like to know how she does it. That's what I would like. What, what, is, what is her skill set? Is, is her skill set being a really good position? Or is her skill set being a really good performer that knows how to surround herself with the right people? That's something I would like to know. And what to the first person you named? What question would you ask? Richard Strauss, yeah. Uh, I wouldn't ask any questions. I would just let him talk. <laughs> just. Uh, I'll, I'll Why master, did he like to talk a lot? Master enlightened, enlightened me about about who you are. <laughs> yeah. Okay. If today was the last day you lived, what would you do? Go home to my family, have lunch together, and then die off. It's okay. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not afraid of of dying. It's uh, I've had a fantastic. I, I hope to live eighty more years. But if it's done today, it's done today. I've uh, I've already uh, experienced some amazing stuff and uh, just be with my people I love and, and have a good meal together and then it's okay. I, I'm I'm it's okay. I'm I'm already happy enough. Awesome. How to make money? By not trying to make money. I think just just to just to everything except trying to make money. Do something good. Do it right and do it. Be be. Uh, uh, be accountable for it. Uh, if you, uh, I'm not saying it's always true, but I, I think people who exceed in life are people that say what they do and do what they say, uh, and that's that's how you make money. But if you want, uh, of course, if you don't have enough money, uh, I understand the feeling that it's really hard. But I, I'm luckily, I, I've been lucky enough to to never have to worry about making money. It's just if you do something. It's a result, but if it's a goal, I think stop it because you will never, never, ever be happy. Next question. I've been asking this since the earliest episode I can remember. I'm glad we talked about it so much, but I have to ask you too. What does art mean to you? Uh, everything and and nothing. At this, it, it's, it's of no use and therefore it's so useful. Um, it, 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 for me, it's, it's a way to balance your life. It's a way to, to travel without going places. It's a way to export yourself from your problems. It's a way to solve problems. It's a way to take a look at, at, at things, but at the same time, it's, it's, um, it's so senseless. It's it, just, just what I do. See for your what, what do we do? We make some vibrations through a hall at a certain moment in time and people pay for it to be there how stupid is that and yet it's it's so powerful it means everything um yeah so, so another example we spoke about was uh, having no value that it's valuable like brussels the capital of becoming the capital of europe yeah, yeah. it's it's exactly that <laughs> yeah so the second question is what value does art add to the society or the world per se? I, I think what art can do as no other is to talk about things you can't talk about. If you lack the words, art has a solution. Uh, and I, I think in, in both ways, if you like the, the most horrible things that happened to us as, as, as humans, art was there to either help us accept, to transcend, to explain, to, to, to move on. That's what art can do. Uh, and art also, um, for me, is for every place of nuance. If if we uh, every generation says, yeah, we have it the best, we have it the hardest. Uh, if you look at uh, writers throughout two, three thousand, four thousand years of history, everybody says, yeah, things are getting more complex. 
that's the, it's a given. And art is always there to explain complex stuff or to express complex stuff. And I think the last thing that art can do, I always say this, uh, I, being in a concert hall or being in an opera or being in a museum, it's one of the few places where let's say you can have an extreme left wing or extreme right wing people together enjoying the same thing. Our art is for me always about nuance. It's always about layers and it's always about wait a minute. There is no one perspective. There is another one. There is another one. There is another one. And that's what I think why art is so important, especially in times where people are looking for easy answers. It's not an easy answer. It's a difficult answer, but I think it's the right answer because of this, all of this layers and complexity, I think. Amazing. You said it, it is useful for um, making it easy to understand complex thing, but some art or music is so complex that you cannot understand. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, totally so, true. Yeah, totally true. Yeah. <laughs> what is the relevance of artists in the world of AI? Because you don't need an orchestra. Every instrument you name, you can, I actually tested out a couple of sites. You can take every instrument, put it on each syllable or uh, each segment that you want. And you have a whole of music composed for you without having to learn any single instrument. Mm -hmm. So that all those years of skills to practice is, yeah. is it relevant? Yeah, it's certainly relevant. I, I think, I think it's good that we evolve and that technology is there to, to, to help. Uh, but I'm, I'm not afraid at all that AI will take the place of, of current performers. Uh, uh, I think AI, and it's, it's, not, it's not a tool. It's more than a tool. AI is, is changing the way we, we see the world and how we're going to structure the world. But it will do, for me, the same as all technology will, will, will do. The bad ones in the market will be killed, killed by it. So if you're a bad composer, bad performer, AI will be replacing you. If you're very good, it will only help you to become better. And for those of us who are like normal good or whatever, it's also a tool to get better to improve and so on. I use AI on a daily basis right now to help me structure my thoughts or whatever. What I see is, uh, and perhaps it changes in the future and then it will change again. It helps me to be more efficient and more effective. And it helps me to take a look at things in, in ways I didn't, didn't see before. But it's clear for me that even if it gets 10 times better, it will remain AI. It will not become human. And, and even if it becomes human, then, then it becomes human, whatever. <laughs> if you're afraid of technology, there is something wrong with you. The only thing that you should do is uh, you should always be wary about the potential effect of technology and therefore, indeed, AI is a game changer because it's, it has the potential to be really bad as well. But that's no reason not to, to believe in AI. I think, uh, and, and I, I'm confident, I heard compositions of AI, it's not bad at all. Really, it is not bad and it, it will help in some aspects, but so two two questions on that. So how what is the role of artist? Is artist relevant in the times of AI? More more, more than ever. More than ever. Because what AI makes possible is the way artists have to work all, already all of them life. Make connections that you can't make before. Be uh, analytical and be esoterical at the same time. Uh, be uh, Art is always about, for me, uh, these different aspects of, of being a good performer, being at the right time, at the right place, in a certain hall and so, whatsoever. Typical stuff that AI can do as well. So now more than ever, we need artists to help us explain this new reality. Artists thrive when not everything is sure, when, when not everything is defined. And we are entering in a new paradigm, in a new, in a new world. And then you need artists to help you make sense of it all. It, it, and nothing against accountants, because we also need good accountants. But that's a skill set that you don't need right now, because the world is changing. We need people who are at ease with change. Ergo, artists. Artists are the artists are the best people when it comes to change, right? Always innovating. So, <laughs> my question was another question related to AI that you said you improve your efficiency and uh, the structure, your flow of thoughts. 
So which software, which AI do you use and how do you do that? I, I use ChatGTP a lot. Just for instance, um, uh, yeah, last thing I, I checked. Yeah, for instance, Excel. I, I need to have a certain uh, calculation in Excel before I went on 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 on. Uh, on, on, on message boards or, or communicate online, how to uh, blah, blah, blah. Now I go to ChatGPT and say, hey, I have this Excel sheet. I want to extract this and this and this data and I want it to be pre presented in a certain type of format. Please do it for me. <laughs> and show me how you do it in the formulas. Fantastic. Saves, wow. saves me five hours of time. And, and Brilliant. I, and I learned something from it at the same time. I learned how to use a certain pivot table or something like that. So, that's how I use AI, to name it one example. What is your favorite advice that you have received? Uh, I, I think uh, it, it's uh, Yoda from Star Wars. Do or don't do, there is no try. Or, I, mean, I have a better one, I have a, have a better one. It's uh, from a book uh, from Ben Horowitz, and it's called When You Have to Eat Shit, don't nibble. And uh, hey, what do you it means? Don't, by, don't it, nibble. Don't nibble. What do you mean by nibble? Nibble is like take a small bite. Just if you're, if you're in a bad situation, yeah, go all, fix it. Just, just go for it. And <laughs> you I, double I, shit. Yeah. Yeah. It, just, just bad things will happen. So don't be like, oh, why is this happening to me or whatever. No, no. Don't, don't hesitate. Go for it. It, it will pass. Amazing. Good way Ash, to remember that message and meaning. What is the most priceless gift that you have ever received? Without a shadow of a doubt, my children. Uh, I think uh, I, for me, it's, it's, it's uh, my, my mother said it to me when I got my first born, said, what you will experience is the following. You will lose <laughs> everything that you have, but you will gain times a thousand some new stuff and it's true you lose your freedom as as a, as a as a person when you become a parent yeah at least the first five six seven years you lose a lot of freedom you, you can't go anywhere you want you can't you can't you have to be responsible you have a job and so on and so on so what you take on as a responsibility is huge yeah, my, my children are older now but still i feel responsible for them um and it's a thing that i wouldn't miss for the world everything that i do in a way is root back to my family to being there for them so that's irreplaceable uh this set it's not for everybody of course but i i like being a parent i like uh having made sure that 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 if ever i go that's not bad but something will remain and and will will continue uh and will be part of society beautiful very beautiful what is one thing you cannot live without smartphone <laughs> it's sad but it's true i can't live it up it's become, <laughs> no I, I can't miss it for for uh, even an hour it's really something i'm uh, i'm addicted to yeah or and do you keep uh, upgrading every year or is it just that has to be there with you like a madman i need to have the latest one yeah it's really something uh, i i have to work on but i every time a certain company from cupertino does something new i have to buy it yeah. Which company? Apple. Uh, I'm a huge Apple freak. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of innovations that are coming up. And maybe why not in future we'll have to take, get those glasses and the new innovation. That's, I, I'm on the you'll need list. it as much as... Yeah. Sorry? I'm on the waiting list. For, uh, oh! Yeah, I have to have it. <laughs> so, similar question. What is what is What are your views on Metaverse? On what a metaverse? Uh, uh, honestly, I I don't understand. I uh, for me, and if if I'm wrong, please correct me. It's 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 a sort of a. I don't need to be virtual. I I like being in this world. I don't have to meet myself for this other world. What I what I do understand is how it can be useful to help understand our current world better augmented reality or explained reality. That's something I, I but the metaverse, uh, I, I, I don't see the point of becoming an avatar, but that's, that's 
just <laughs> my two cents uh, on yes yes it's on a very nation stage let's see how it evolves there's so many Absolutely. mystery and questions that that come with it it's a technology isn't it stand at the moment what is on your bucket list next uh i next uh, what i i want to want to see more of the world that's really something i would like to i'm i'm now 42 before i'm retiring i would like to have visited yeah like like india or like australia africa that's a, a, a really sort of a blind spot for me so that's bucket list material seeing the world a lot more than than i've done done done, done today uh, certainly that yeah what gets you excited about the future yeah actually um there is a lot of pessimism right now uh but i do believe that there is still a world becoming more and more flat i i still think that's a a, a true statement the world is becoming more and more flat therefore yeah we are coming becoming also more and more aware of where you, where we are from uh I, i in 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 this sense what i what i like about the future is i hope we get to a moment in time where people don't say where are you from uh, based on how you look or or what your religion is or whatever but that people ask where are you local and uh, i ah. like i like this idea that that uh, uh, a north african woman can be local in brussels or that uh, i can be local in mumbai i don't know that that's something which i i still see possible this means a lot this means that we need to change how we see people and and i i understand that the world right now is a different place but that's still what i think is possible in our future that and you are excited that. about it yeah yeah amazing what is your favorite movie um wow good uh, uh actually i don't watch such much movies i i yeah guilty pleasure west side story the old one yeah. it's it's really dated but i i still like it for uh yeah talking on movies it it brought me a question about drama so we know orchestras and music is highly popular in belgium but is is that the case with drama also like stage performance or do you club it with orchestra and music no no it's that's uh, one of the good things about belgium our cultural life our our, our venues our halls is is amazing everything that the world has to offer i think at one moment in time will pass by and that's the beauty of being in the center of europe we really see yeah all the big shows all the small shows avant-garde uh underworld uh underground uh main stuff uh we have the luxury here of being close to fantastic fantastic performers at the gardens from here from the world every yeah and opera in a way is also like a drama right Absolutely. it's a musical <laughs> it's it's if it's good it's the best if it's bad it's really bad opera but i i like opera a lot yeah what is your favorite book my favorite book um Yeah it's perhaps uh one you you don't know it's called the the sorrow of belgium it's like a uh sorrow of belgium yeah it's a uh, by a, a flemish author of the 80s i i it's it's again what what we talked about earlier it's about what belgium is not it's about yeah for me the soul of belgium is reflected in that book but it's it's in my it's in my native language and uh, i i don't think it's that well known but that's that's for me one of the the, the books that i keep on de reading keep on uh, retaking it yeah so what is the soul of belgium yeah that that's what the book is about it's like like uh it's it's defined by just say yeah yeah, yeah we're, we're not we're not dutch we're not french we're not german we're not uh we're not britons we we are belgians but what are you what are you then i'm sorry i can't say because also our our culture is like we we steal from a lot of other cultures we we mix it all together and and that book <laughs> it's 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 all about that how how yeah it's difficult to explain actually so you can explain what you are not but it's difficult to explain what you are yeah <laughs> at least for me for every other other dog that can do it for so, not me <laughs> absolutely and wonderful and i like it's a good coincidence that you named that book uh yeah. as the book in this episode what is your favorite food 
uh, whatever the cook is good. I I I can't say I I do like uh, our own cuisine, but uh, I was last holiday I was in Greece on holidays. I like Greek food as well. I'm, I'm, Name one dish that you would uh, like, like any time, any day you would like. Uh, yeah, I have one. Uh, like uh, it's a, a typical Belgian dish. It's called crevet gris. Like uh, uh, small shrimps with tomato uh, and with French okay. fries. Uh, really good. Yeah. Please give me the name of that too. I'll add an image here. Yeah. So, um, interesting. <laughs> what do you like to do for fun? Uh, I like to walk. Uh, it's really something which uh, gives me a lot of, of uh, peace of mind. And also, I, I just like it. Just, I go to a walk every day. Uh, and uh, that's one thing I like about COVID. I started to play my instrument again. So I, I, I started to play music again. I stopped for a while. Uh, and that's also something which I really like just to get my mind at, at ease. Um, you know, it would be really awesome if when you go back home, if you record yourself playing your trombone. So I can add it with this episode. Yeah. It'll be really, really amazing. I'll, I'll see what I can do. Yeah. If you had the power to go either in future or in the past, where would you go and why? I would go to, uh, uh, let's say, uh, ancient Rome. Yeah. That's something I would think I'd like to see. Yeah. Why? Yeah, uh, because I, I, I think that's also, uh, uh, as an interesting culture in general, I think that's where, where the European culture started. I think I would like to be there uh, where everything began. Uh, but I, I think the, if I can time travel, why limit myself to one place? I would like to go to a, a lot of places <laughs> and see what happens. And, you know, as I was asking this question, I've asked many people, but suddenly I thought, wouldn't it be cool to be like a tree in just one place and see the whole millennia pass by like Absolutely. you can see all the ages Absolutely. from one point of view one place absolutely so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely that's a, a really good a really good image yeah <laughs> yeah uh, what advice would you give your younger self listen to your parents more <laughs> i think uh, <laughs> I've, I've i've tried a lot myself so uh, perhaps i should have listened more but yeah in, in a way that's also being part of young so um yeah. Also, perhaps, perhaps um, try even harder. Tr be try to be your best at everything. Because yeah, the more you get in, the more you can put out again. Uh, yeah. Don't slack. Go for it. What are your thoughts on NFTs and Web three? Uh, it's actually the same as the metaverse. I, I, I. But perhaps I'm wrong. I don't see the added value that much. I I, so, I, I do see the use case for like blockchain. I, I see it in, in contracts as well. But the NFT, perhaps somebody should explain it to me, but I, I don't see the added value. Okay, so let me try to explain. I've been there for a year or two. What I see if my NFT is fundamentally ownership of a digital asset. Yeah. So it's a it's a contract. You can define ownership of a digital or digital asset, which wasn't possible before this. Yeah. So digital art so, or digital music. But I, I see. So I agree. So that's how I understand it as well. But I don't see the revolution in that. It just it's just a another way of of of. But again, I'm I'm perhaps not that well informed. <laughs> I, I don't see the other value. Yeah, it's still to evolve and it's still to figure out it's just that how we are going more digital and more online. Mm -hmm. So you can start having digital ownership and things there. So we have covered all the signature round questions. I had some questions that I had saved for the end. You are a creative entrepreneur and you have given an amazing talk on TED about it. Artists have all, are always struggling or there are tough times and a lot of our audiences also art based or artists, how, what advice would you give them to make the most of their passion as well as a career and maybe just to survive and have a good life? Yeah, um, don't quit too early. I think uh, keep keep on going as long as you can. But yeah, do. Uh, it's not given for everybody. 
Uh, and, and it's really difficult, especially uh, if you call yourself an artist uh, and you don't have an audience and you do everything right, marketing, uh, PR, and so on and so on. Yeah, take a look at it. Though, because yeah, being an artist is like idealized. It's not the only way to be happy. So be an artist if it's something that that you really can't see yourself not doing. If you see yourself being happy as an accountant or as a teacher or whatever, take that route. It's only when you can't be otherwise, yeah, then you have to do it. And then don't quit that easy. But it's it's such a hard world and it's such a there are so many hurdles to pick. Uh unless you're prepared to do it, to go all for it, yeah, just don't do it because then it will only frustrate you. And I think life is really too short to be frustrated. Uh and there are other ways. But if you don't see another way, yeah, then it's your way and then go for it. And, th and then I think you will succeed. But it's difficult to give an advice because, yeah, I, I might be wrong as well. So um, th mm. my advice is not worth more than, than somebody else's advice, I think. Thank you for that. I would highly recommend you to watch this movie called Disciple. It's a very philosophical movie about whether artist art is to be performed for your own self or is it for the audience or the public as you said the audience is also the significance and uh, the what it is that that's important but there are some artists who say art is just for self pleasure and it's for yourself and it is way to attend a uh, spirituality through art not not for, <laughs> not for me in any way uh, I, I think it's uh, it's always for an audience i i, I think yeah Awesome. It was amazing to have you on okay. the show today. Likewise. And I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Um, but it's fun, right? It's a V because I studied German. I thought it was fun. No, it's fun. It is, uh, if you do, you do Bart van der Roost. Okay. But <laughs> you, were, you were almost there. Okay. Uh, but so much. Thank you so much for coming here. Uh, any Any parting words you'd like to say for the audience no I, thank you for having me Tamay. it was a pleasure <laughs> okay thank you so much and any feedback from me <laughs> no i think you're doing a great job and, and i think i like the idea that you try to reach out to the world and get get them to to where you live i think it's uh, always good to make connections absolutely amazing thank you see you all in the next episode guys <laughs>